sex talk. Derek and Miley. Cause sexuality is tough. And okay, sex just isn't good enough. No. Sex talk. With Derek and Miley. Hey, folks. Welcome to Sex Talk with Erica Miley. Erica Miley here. I have the wonderful Heather McPherson, licensed professional counselor, supervisor, licensed marriage and family therapist, supervisor, ASECT and Sexual Health Alliance certified sex therapist and founder of Respark Therapy and Associates, both in Texas and Colorado. Hold on one more breath. And host of Practice Outside the Lines podcast. You're busy like me. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> oh yeah so many things i feel like i just keep on adding them on we have a nonprofit to arm of respark therapy i forgot to say respark foundation which sees um, survivors of sexual harm so i do 25 an hour so doing that as well it's just all the things yeah <laughs> hey like that's that's how we i think some of us who are tend to be like <laughs> entrepreneurial we tend to put our fingers in too many things and then but then that way we're not bored i think <laughs> i think that's a yeah. big part of it but (laughs) thank you for coming on the show added the ball yeah no worries I mean I think that you know when you're I'm in I've been in the field for over a decade so I feel like you just slowly keep on adding more and more (laughs) (laughs) you do and you get interested in things you get nerdy about things and that's what the show's about is all the all of the nerd shit we get so uh, I'm, I'm just really, I'm, I'm just so glad that you're here with me today. We're going to talk all about vulvas and desire discrepancies, and we're going to just we're going to jump into it because, like you just said, you've got over a decade in the field, and and I when I was thinking about the se- a season about vulvas, I was thinking about including professionals who have uh, professionalists and uh, professionalists. Yeah, that that's a word. <laughs> that that's, works. that's what we're that's what we're doing today. <laughs> that that in, that absolutely uh, hear patterns about vulvas so regularly that it sometimes feels like I think for us who who do this work all the time, it, we can we can ourselves feel like a broken record. So I I really wanted to bring oh, to light yes. the things that we say all the time, especially to the, our our the vulva owners that are in our practices and in our in our coaching. So um let's let's just jump right into desire discrepancy. So like what is it what is it like to, what's the kind of phone call you get from someone who has a vulva and and what's it like when they first walk into your office or telehealth yeah. now? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Tell them their first call, I'll pick up an email or whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that we have a, with Respark Therapy and Associates, the, the group practice for, that we're in Colorado and Texas, we just have a lot of women calling our, our people with vulvas. So self-identified mm-hmm. women or people with vulvas calling to say that they have a desire discrepancy, but typically they don't use that language. Typically they mm-hmm. say, I want more sex than my partner. Mm-hmm. That's more so. Some of it is my partner wants more sex than me, but we're, we're seeing kind of this trend of um, vulva owners wanting more sex mm-hmm. than their partner. And that's what we see come in the door more often now. Yeah, I definitely see both myself. And I also, get, and I, I'm not sure that, If you're, I'm not going to speak for you if you're seeing this too. I I get quite a few vulva owners who are starting to try to understand not only their own sexuality, but how that is, has been impacted by their mental health and trying to understand like, oh, why is it that I can't stay with a fantasy or why is it that I, my body isn't uh, responding how, how I thought it, how it did before or how I thought it should. And then we're, we're often trying to, to tease apart uh, the why is, are you, are you hearing the same things? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, uh, of course, a lot of it comes down to anatomy, male identify people with, that are, have a penis can look down mm-hmm. and see that they are aroused. Um, mm-hmm. Vulva owners typically don't have that immediate kind of reinforcement of I am aroused. Yes, I think I, I'm curious what your thoughts about how much, of course, like we, if we could break out a pie chart and give you very specific nerdy pie chart statistics, we would. But <laughs> I, I, I'm just curious, like how much you think culture is also a big piece of especially for those who have all of us, like 
why they are so divorced from their body. Like this isn't like, I mean, just with uh, the lack of sex education, the lack of um, or <laughs> the increase in the the diet industry, all of those kinds of things. Like I'd love mm-hmm. to hear what you think of the impact of culture generally. Yeah. I, so I think that vulva owners, like I said, they have a, a difficult kind of immediate reinforcement to know that they're aroused unless they touch themselves and see that they are um, aroused. And so I think that there's that piece. But I think that just in general, uh, Volvo owners in the Western, you know, part of the world. So in mm-hmm. the U.S., uh, aren't typically taught to look at themselves or to, mm-hmm. especially if you're in kind of a religious area, if you're in the Bible Belt or something, some area like that, you, you're taught not to touch it, not to look at it, not to talk about it, and so as a result you have a very distant knowledge and distant view of what's actually going on, what actually it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it, I think it's very easy for vulva owners to feel disconnected, detached, not understand, of course, your anatomy, but not understand how that part of your body is connected to the rest of your body. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And that your your experience of your vulva isn't just when you urinate or when you are experiencing menstruation or (laughs) Mm -hmm. that, that, and how many times uh, were folks told like that is dirty. Like Mm -hmm. this is, that's gross. Or (laughs) I mean, we're not even talking, we haven't even, gotten close to the shame around menstruation and sex. I mean, I didn't even think we we're going to take this turn, but let's take it. Like, <laughs> what do you, what do you hear from the vulva owners about their worries around menstruation and sex? Yeah. I, well, I mean, I think that just that alone, if you're disconnected and detached and the only experience you have is maybe pain mm-hmm. um, during ministration, or, you know, maybe you weren't taught about what that means. You weren't given that, you know, that educational talk about it mm-hmm. whenever you first started administrating. I think that there can be a lot of, a lot of disconnect. And and then also, I think that, you know, we, we have a lot of people that come to respark therapy that, you know, maybe they've, they have not experienced tampons or discs, like flex discs. That's what I love. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the, the discs that you just put it in for 12 hours and you forget about it. Um, mm-hmm. But I think a lot of people have a difficulty, people that come to us will sometimes report difficulty even putting a tampon in because mm-hmm. it's, it's painful. So I think that there's a lot of issues around menstruation that can connect to painful sex with vulva owners. Absolutely. I, I mean, just uh, speaking for myself, and I'm, if you're not, uh, no, no pressure here. But I remember, I remember the myths. I remember the things I heard when, when I was in, I, I was probably maybe 12, when I started to hear some of those things from my peers of like, well, if you swim, this was, this was definitely one of those ones I heard a lot. If you're swimming, your period just stops. Yeah, <laughs> <Totally>. <laughs> and this, these were these kinds of myths that we just exchanged yeah. as as young mm-hmm. teenagers or preteens that it was just like, oh no, this yeah. is how this is. And I mm-hmm. I remember I remember many of my Volva owning friends, the girls that we'd run into the bathroom together, and whoever hadn't put in a tampon yet, the other girls were going to stand on the outside of the door and coach each other through it. Because nobody was telling us, Aww. nobody was te- teaching us, totally. nobody was nobody was doing any of that. Yeah, and they totally. and they sure as shit didn't talk about it in like our sex ed classes oh, in a, yeah. in a really really good way. So what about that's you? So like what, did, what were some of those myths you heard when you oh were in my like gosh, sixth seventh grade? That's so funny. I remember my best girlfriend doing the same thing, coaching me how to put a tampon in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I totally I, with you in that experience. I um, think that's like yeah, a cultural I mean, like yeah. yeah Young, like, young girl. And I was thing so like, that, I don't understand. How I don't know what to there? do. Like, what's going how? On? like, how do you know when it's all the way in? Like, there's just so many questions. Oh, you know? and the, there was the question of like, <laughs> if you use a a tampon. I mean, we 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 you know kind of we use the the sexual debut language now mm-hmm. as adults, yeah. but like back then it was like, well, if you use a tampon, 
do you lose your virginity? Exactly, like that, yeah, that was yeah. that was a very real conversation when we were young mm-hmm. kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that those same conversations are still going on now, which is why it's so important to obviously have accurate and comprehensive sex ed. And I think that I mean that leads into kind of oh my, my mission with the yes. Sexual Health Alliance and just educating healthcare mm-hmm. providers about how to have those conversations um, with not only adults but adolescents too, because you have you know kids kids, adolescents, adults coming into uh, medical practices, you know, whether it's a physical physician or a OBGYN or maybe even a therapist talking about this. And, yeah. you know, I think a lot of times, you know, they can get deer in the headlights of, oh, God, that's not what I learned in med school or that's not what I learned in grad school. And so I feel like that's my mission with Sexual Health Alliance is just to be able to provide those the, those educational hours and um, and certification programs so people can actually get that training. Yes, I think that's beautifully put. So you, you, folks out there, you professional folks, we're, we're going to get into all of the pluggables at the end. But but Heather has a wonderful program for you to be able to get CEUs around se- sexual health that is accurate information, that is research informed, that I, I want to say this to all the professionals out there who do this work. And I, you don't have to be a sex therapist. You don't have to. You can be any kind of professional who maybe is maybe client a sex coach. Facing. You want to become I, a sex coach or something. Yes. Yeah. Or even like some of the, the I, I have interacted with quite a few medical doctors who do not I have know. and yeah. wish they had more. They get up to 10, lucky to get 10, but up to 10 hours of sexuality training. It's usually anatomy based. So Again, mm-hmm. that's why they're deer in the headlights of when you know someone starts yeah. talking about sex. It's like, oh, I really know anatomy. But I think that that just, you know, kind of wrapping it back around, that's why it's so important for us to be able to talk about it, you mm-hmm. know, for vulva owners to be able to talk about it with other vulva owners and to be share and trade ideas and information. And I think that, you know, in, in our office, in Respect Therapy, with all the therapists that we have, I, I hear a lot of our interns and associates talking about how, you know, it it was was something that they don't feel comfortable talking about with their girlfriends. And these are vulva owners that sometimes are in their thirties, forties, fifties. Oh, I never talked about that with my girlfriends. I didn't think that was okay. I didn't want to feel weird or awkward. And so it's like, Oh, so, Oh, that just breaks mm-hmm. my heart. You never were able to like have those experiences that we just shared yes. earlier in the show. Right. But um, where you have your, you know, your peers teaching yeah. you, Hey, this is how you put a tampon. Hey, this is, this is what it's like. Oh, it's okay. No worries. Just stick your finger up there you know this is yours it's okay for you to touch it (laughs) it's okay okay for you to touch your vulva and understand what what it feels like how it looks and what how it smells and every part of it is 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 typical and if there's something that's not you don't think is typical that it's okay to ask questions and so coming coming back to desire um that connection to body and experience i think is we've already started talking about that and, and i'm curious like when someone comes in to to talk to you about this where do you usually start do you start with mindfulness how do you get them to come to their body and start you know essentially meeting it like a new friend yeah i mean i think first you you know we just gain permission to be able to talk about it and what is it like to use um and you know correct terminology and that can be a huge piece of the equation right we're taught to say hoo-ha and (laughs) you know all these different like the jj and all these different terms colloquially terms that represent your vulva and your vagina and and i think Mm -hmm. that just you know gaining permission to either use the language of your client or to use anatomically correct language um, so that we can provide a little bit of psychoeducation and then help them kind of feel more confident confident and comfortable, maybe even looking at themselves with a mirror, what would that be like? That that scares the hell out of some people. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Absolutely. (laughs) I have had many a client just look at me a little afraid at Star Trek or (laughs) even sometimes anger. Like you want me to do what? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) You want me to do what with a Uh mirror? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, but then yeah, they come and- back to me. I like what, like uh, I can definitely describe like how many times uh, a vulva owner has come back to a session and said, "I did what you said, and I am, mm-hmm. 
I am stunned at what I saw. I <laughs> didn't, I didn't yeah. expect to uh-huh. see that, that, that my, I might have like pink and browns and, and mm-hmm. I have these different colors and, and I have mm-hmm. these different, it is not at all scary yeah. or, or something awful. So like, do you, do you hear that too from, from your folks when, when you ask them to take a look? Yeah, I mean, I think that oftentimes it can be comforting, it can be um, kind of uh, helpful in them understanding their whole body and that, you know, it would be like, kind of like, oh, I don't, I don't ever look at the back of my head. That's not something that's okay. Right? Mm -hmm. I don't ever get a mirror and look at that. That that's weird. Right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) So like, I kind of normalize. What can you imagine what a haircut would be like if (laughs) if no, if no person who cuts hair didn't hand you a mirror to take a look at the back? Can you imagine how that would right. go? You're like, no, just ignore that part. It, it's it's dirty. It's gross. You don't need yeah, to look at it. Exactly. What? So I you try what? to like kind of normalize in that way that like, hey, this is just another body part. But then, you know, you also have vulva owners and people that kind of have the opposite reaction where, you know, my I don't look like those people in the films around porn. Mm. And what does that mean? And and you know, I've had many clients that come in and say, I want surgery or I want Botox, you know, and mm. on my vulva, or I want this, or I want that, because um it doesn't look like what I've seen everywhere, mm-hmm. um, which yeah, it doesn't because it's natural. It's not something that's been altered or you know put mm-hmm. Botox in or had surgery in. And you know, obviously in porn, there's a lot of things that they do, um, mm-hmm. and you know, to each their own. If you want to do that, go for it. it makes you feel comfortable, but mm-hmm. it also works against our culture in terms of I feel shame because I don't look like other people. I feel embarrassed because mm-hmm. I don't look like what I've seen. Right. I I think one of the the greatest gifts we could give to vulva owners is start when especially like even before then, like when young ones are coming up that they see lots of different pictures. We don't have mm-hmm. to show young ones porn, but we show them bodies that mm-hmm. are from all over the spectrum mm-hmm. of shape, size, and that every one of us has genitalia that look a little different. Exactly. Yeah. I love the, the book of vulvas, uh, the book of vulvas, which shows, uh, you know, hundreds of different right. vulvas. There's so many different shapes and sizes and they are all beautiful. Yes. I know. Penis owners, you too. Y'all need to see oh, lots yeah. of different penises. You need to <laughs> totally. see that, that there are so many different sizes and shapes and colors and just right. like vulvas. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's there's everything in between. We all could benefit from that that normalization of that. There's just variety, just like there's varieties in our hands and our feet and our nose. The way we look, like, our face, yeah, <laughs> and that's what makes it beautiful. Yes, absolutely. So, I I hear you like in like inviting your clients to essentially be able to feel maybe fill their lives with maybe different images like i i i am often struck by how many wonderful sex educators and sex therapists and and other people in our field who encourage our people to to get on instagram and unfollow all the people that don't necessarily look like them and start following people that yeah. broaden the horizon yeah. of bodies do you oh, think that's, yeah. that's good, something you... oh my gosh that's something that um dr chris donahue he's he does love line took over for dr drew he um mm. he's our clinical director at sexual health lines and he always talks about that every single lecture that he gives for us he always says Get your clients social media and look at what they're following because yes. guaranteed that's part of the problem. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, I think that's a, I, I, I mean, beautifully put, beautifully put. I, I work with a lot of folks who are experiencing eating disorders. And mm-hmm. that's one of the things I am, I am very keenly asking them and I'm asking them to pull out their phones and show me after, tell me what is on your Instagram right now. Exactly. Yeah, tell well, me what so you are you filling your head with all yes. day long. Yep. And a lot of mindless the time, rolling. <laughs> yeah, and, but that's the thing. It's not mindless. We I all know, know it, that it's, it's not mindless, that it's impacting us oh, actually yeah. very deeply mm-hmm. and, and being able to expose yourself again and again and again to something else, to things that, 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 that help you break down like the, the 
the body dysmorphia that happens from constantly feeding your brain like what you think is supposed to happen, mm -hmm. right? In quotation marks. Oh, Y'all can't yeah. see me doing my quote fingers. But... <laughs> I see. <laughs> <laughs> I'll confirm for the audience. <laughs> Thank you. That. So like when, when we're talking about like communication about de desire discrepancies to partners, like let's talk a little bit about that. Like what, what are you often... Um, like step one for folks to be able to to talk to partners about like I I I want more sexual intimacy from you or I would like maybe less. <laughs> how how do you yeah. how do you how do they start those conversations? Yeah, I mean, I think again, gaining permission that it's okay to talk about this, kind of setting mm. the space and and creating that environment where we're comfortable having those conversations. I think that's huge and that's so basic, but it's so important. Um, so you're saying then, don't start with a fight, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think that, you know, having both parties um, talk about kind of their perspective, their experience and having the other person really listen and not really think about everything that they're going to about to say, <laughs> really mm -hmm. listen, reflect and validate and understand what's going on. And again, these are such basic therapy skills, but I think that just helping your partner understand where you're coming from and the why behind it and the mm -hmm. experience with it goes such a long way because, you know, oftentimes it comes down to, I want to feel loved. I want to feel mm. desired. Um, I want to feel beautiful. Um, or, yeah. you know, I'm just horny and and I want you and I, and I want it all the time. And that's yeah. okay too, you know, and, and, you know, how you communicate that, how you initiate those conversations is sometimes, a lot of the work, right? You know, I think mm -hmm. that, you know, learning how to flirt, <laughs> learning how to compliment and communicate and say, you know, this is something that I'm thinking about doing later to you, right? Um, mm -hmm. Having those conversations and building anticipation is such a huge piece of this as well to make sure that you're getting, of course, consent, but you're also just having fun with it. Yes, you're talking about something that is so incredibly important, which is the runway to sex. Exactly. Which is so important that especially for our many of our vulva owners, it takes many of them. Look, roughly what did Emily Nagoski find? Like 70 percent, 70 percent of the vulva owners. It takes a significant amount of time. Yeah. Oh, it's for, a time too. Yeah. <laughs> for, for not only just the connection to be made from the head to the vulva, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. for that for that that anticipation to start to build, which will then result in any kind of sexual interaction. And right. so I, I, that, that runway is so very important. I know my listeners, y'all have probably heard me say that 115 million times, but <laughs> Heather is here to just confirm for you that again, that it's something we hear from so many people, this expectation of, uh, well, I tell you I want sex and then we're going to have sex. And that yeah. is so that it, it does. Yeah. It makes it, it makes sex and the interaction of sex very, very yeah. narrow. Yeah. And the only way that that does work is whenever, you know, it's a newer relationship and or you've been thinking mm -hmm. about sex all day and you're mm -hmm. ready to go and you're ready for a quick year. You're ready to just jump their bones, which is also great. Great. Cool. Love that when that happens. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's not an everyday thing. It's not it happens all the time. It's happened some of the time if all the conditions are right. And it, let's be real. We've all just been through one of the hardest years. And oh, yeah. a majority of us are are not necessarily thinking about sex all day long. And mm -hmm. or maybe one of the partners in, that we're involved with maybe did and we didn't. Or maybe maybe you vulva owners out there have kids at home. There's oh nothing gosh, yeah. sexy about, you know, dishes and and chores and mm -hmm. making sure kids get bed on time. And I, I mean, before we jumped on, I told you my kid was up last night in the middle oh of the night. Gosh, How am I feeling well. today on a Friday? I'm feeling very <laughs> tired and I don't want yeah. anything to do with anybody in my house. <laughs> and that's so common. That's our existence, right? Oh, yeah. It's the world so, now. So being able to find that that entrance to the runway, I think, is really, really, mm -hmm. really important. So when you see success stories, because I, I don't want to just like harp on like this is this is how you start and this is how you should be doing. It. Oh, sure. <laughs> but yeah. when, when you hear success from folks, 
what is, what is the kind of language they're saying? Like, what does success mean to many of these folks that you see? Whenever I hear clients having fun with it again, getting oh, excited yes. about it again, that it's like, it, it's play, right? Mm. That they're a little bit more relaxed, a little bit more laid back. They're finding new ways to have pleasure with each other and mm-hmm. maybe even with themselves independently. And and it's it's a different approach, different paradigm to how we think about sexuality and how we approach it with ourselves and our partners. Mm -hmm. I think uh, you are on that path to essentially just saying like, it success isn't what you think it was going to be at the beginning of the sessions. Right. <laughs> I think many of our clients may come to us and think like, oh, if I go to therapy or if I go to sex therapy, that I'll be, you know, cured and be having sex <laughs> all the time or every day or I'll have some magic thing will happen and, and everything will expectations. be better. <laughs> and I think that's what we're we're saying is that the the managing of expectations is one of one of the first things exactly. that we have to allow ourselves to do, right? Like and mm-hmm. drop our expectations of outcome and be willing to play along the way as we start to learn the things that we're actually aroused by. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I am uh just so appreciative that you hung out with me today. And uh oh, I want you to I'm be able I'm- to uh <laughs> plug all of the things so how do people find you in the world (laughs) well first thank you so much for having me on it's so it's been so fun getting to know you and hanging out with you too of course yeah you know respark therapy and associates uh, respark.co is the ad the website uh therapy practice in colorado and texas 14 therapists and sexualhealthalliance.com you know we actually invite everyone to come and, and get sex education because we don't think yes. it should be proprietary. We want, you know, not only mental and medical professionals, but also their partners and their friends, you know, mm. especially when we were in person, we really loved that because it was just fun. You know, we were just yes. all learning the fun, the fun things. So yeah, that's sexualhealthalliance.com. And then, um, and then practice outside the lines is a podcast that I do. And, you know, you, you're, you've been on and we'll be releasing that soon too. So yeah, I think that covers at least some of it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's always the Google and, and they will find you somehow. And I will make oh, sure yes. everything is in the show notes. <laughs> thank you again, Heather. And folks, yeah, no, thanks for you. sticking around till the end. And we will see you next time. Awesome.